This is going to be a, a symposium on DMT entities, which is probably the first ever kind of symposium on DMT entities, I think, ever. So, this is historic. Yeah. I know that was the symposium on DMT. This is the first symposium on DMT entities. And this is going to be. That's my mum. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, uh, so, it's doing very well organised. Um, so I'm going to introduce the first speaker, which is me, uh, David Luke, and I'm going to be talking about how does one prove one's elf? Exploring the ontology of discarnate entities in the DMT realm. We're here to talk about DMT. You probably all know what DMT is. Um, very strong, naturally occurring psychedelic molecule, very small molecule, naturally occurring in the human body, naturally occurring in many plants and animals. Curiously absent from fungus, uh, they have their own version, it's called psilocin, for hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. This is NA. Um, they have their own version. Uh, which, uh, you know, all know that if you eat DMT, it's not going to do anything because it gets broken down by enzymes in your stomach. So the most common way to ingest it is to smoke it, um, typically, or in a brew like ayahuasca. Uh, if you smoke it, you get a very intense 10 minute experience, best done with your eyes closed and lying down. And uh, well, various commentators have suggested it's a bit like being punched in the head by God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll go for that. <laughs> Obviously, some of the phenomena you get in the experience of things like uh, geometric patterns and toptics. Uh, Alan Watts, the, the famous kind of Zen monk and raconteur, was infamous for being able to just talk non-stop, and he never shut up. And, he and his friends like Tim Leary, they tried various psychedelics on him and he just carried on talking yeah, endlessly. <laughs> and uh, so they discovered DMT, or well, this will get him. And so they gave him a hit of DMT. And of course it shut him up, I was telling a story, it shut him up for 10 minutes. And then he came back and he carried on the story where he left off. <laughs> <laughs> but he did say uh, that trying to kind of have a running commentary of the experience was like being fired out of an atomic cannon with neon Byzantine barreling. So again, it's kind of intense geometric images. Um, which often some of the experience report are not just kind of really nice three-dimensional geometry. Often people talk about them having extra dimensions. In fact, uh, Rick Strassman's re uh, subjects in his study, pretty much all of them in the high-dose experience reported having either a fourth-dimensional imagery or extra-dimensional. They yeah, kind of had a category that on their questionnaire. So there's some of the strange phenomena people get. The one we're most interested in, in the DMT experience, oh, that jumped a bit, yeah, the praying mantis. But people have these encounters with entities. So about half of Rick Strassman's participants uh, in that study in the high doses have these kind of otherworldly experiences where they would encounter entities of some variety, sometimes praying mantis-like beings. Praying mantises is one, often kind of inserting strange objects into people, doing operations on them. Uh, often, of course, you get elves, as Terence McKenna famously said, you get elves, everybody does. <laughs> uh, not quite everybody, but a lot of people do get elves. Um, so, why is that? Uh, I've got some other speculations on that I won't get to, because I've not got time. Uh, but you don't need DMT necessarily to get elves. Uh, I, went, I organized a parapsychology conference in Brazil. I'm doing another one next week here. <laughs> and, uh, but we had this kind of journey into altered states every evening and, and on this particular occasion, uh, the last journey into altered states, we went to see the indigenous people there, the Warani and for a tobacco ceremony and something went a bit weird, there was something more than tobacco going around which they didn't tell us about and I was there with my students and uh, <laughs> they do a field trip and well, in the morning, we were trying to piece together what happened last night. We went to see these Indians, and it all got a bit strange. And uh, in the morning, my students were like, did you see the little man running around the Indians, uh, around the fire in the Indians' tent? And I was like, mm, no, I don't recall seeing a little man. And the other one said, yeah, I saw him too. I was like, oh, really? You both saw him? So, yeah. like, two people uh, apparently saw this little 
man running around. So what did he look like? And he goes, well, I drew a little picture. He looked like this. This little man here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, him. No, I didn't see him, but I saw a little woman looking just like him. Uh, on the minibus coming home from the Indians. She was kind of peering over the chairs in front of me, like, ooh, that is. The little, little wizened face. She looked about 300 years old, which had these big armoured eyes. And she had a smile from here to here. She kept winking at me. Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, wow, who is that? I was like, I'm, sh I'm, sure, I'm sure I don't remember her coming on the minibus with us. Um, she's one of the delegates. I don't remember. Uh, turns out it slipped us some Dechura. So um, little did I know. That was an interesting lecture the next day. Uh, <laughs> you were there, yeah. Uh, so. It's not always DMT, but I digress, so I'll get back to DMT. Just checking how we do for time. Oh, I'm running out, luckily. So, uh, obviously we know about Strassman's theory that uh, they are related to near-death experiences. Um, they don't necessarily completely map one-to-one -one with near-death experiences. Um, you know the classic near-death experience, you maybe have some life-threatening accident, you uh, have an out-of-body experience, you see a tunnel of light, you move through the tunnel, you meet some deceased relative, uh, you have a life review, and you pop back in your body. They say, well, it's not your time. Those kinds of experiences can occur on DMT, but the DMT experiences are also, can be a lot weirder and a lot more different. So that's one kind of thing that can happen. Experiences of cosmic consciousness, out-of-body experiences, as I've said, and alien abduction-like experiences which ties in somewhat, as many commentators have said, with the elf experience. If you look at elven uh, encounters and encounters with pixies from folklore, such as uh, Evans Wentz classic study um, from 1911, yeah, more or less, uh, they have similar syndrome of, of kind of phenomenology to the alien abduction experience. So there's these pixies, they come along, they maybe have some kind of breeding program, they try and steal your children, you lose a sense of time. They're little creatures with big almond-shaped eyes, not too dissimilar from the whole alien abduction phenomenon. So one idea is that maybe alien abduction experiences are spontaneous DMT experiences. People say they're as real actually more real than this real, as they do with DMT. Um, where am I going with this? I really am winging this, I'm afraid, so it's a bear with me. Ayahuasca, we all know about that, Shakruna, uh, Shuar Indians, drinking ayahuasca. DMT, we're back to that again. Uh, I'll just skip all these. Uh, Shakruna again, these are, my slides are a bit of a mess. Uh, let's try and find a point to get to, shall we? Yeah, Pineal gland. Tawara, Tawara lizards, very nice, almost extinct. Pineal gland on top of the head. Uh, yeah, theories about pineal gland and DMT. We'll skip all of that and uh, let's get to. Have we got some? Oh, here we go. That's it. Let's jump to the ontology because that's a real interesting thing. Okay, so what are the basic theories about? So, why do people encounter elves, for instance, or other entities? Um, and there's a few different positions you could take. So, it's basically the constructivist or maybe the neurotheological position might suggest these are just uh, the product of uh, brain chemistry. You know, you're having a kind of special brain event and uh, maybe kind of extra neurochemical firing going on, but nothing more than that. You know, for some reason it just produces elves and prey mantises. Um, these experiences are somehow universal and just hardwired into our, into our kind of cerebral makeup. Uh, so akin to that, we have the contextualist uh, position whereby the experience itself is always culturally mediated. Uh, you can never get away from a, a non-culturally mediated experience, so it's always going to be influenced by your life experience, okay? And somehow the DMT elf meme has, has snuck in perhaps unconsciously, and therefore when you have DMT, you get elves. Everybody does. Um, so that's the contextualist position. Then you have the more kind of essentialist, perennialist position, where maybe you are tapping into some kind of genuine uh, other realm, perhaps. Maybe these things are archetypes, although archetypes themselves aren't well explained or understood. Um, so the entities may ne not necessarily be real, they may just be, uh, they may belong to another realm, but they may just be manifestations of our own psychology. And then you could have a literalist position as that, yes, the elves are real. Um, I'm going to finish there, but. One thing I'm going to say, I'm just going to open up for questions because 
I don't really have much prepared here. But uh, uh, interestingly, in the folkloric accounts, like from Evans Wentz from 1911, is that when he asked the people who'd had these experiences, when there was an oral tradition of pixies and elves and all this kind of thing in the kind of Celtic nations, as he called them, is that people most often associated them with spirits of the dead. And there, he said, he put forward this idea that they're the kind of these uh, fourth dimensional entities, but they kind of represent spirits of the dead, which interestingly ties in a little bit with this whole near-death experience uh, kind of theory about them. I'm going to leave it there pretty much. I'll open up for a few questions and then we're just going to move on to the other uh, speakers which will probably, hopefully, definitely enlighten us a bit more about the nature of DMT entities. So, I don't know if we have a word from mine. Uh, I'll just hand over to the chair. That's my talk, thank you. Darko, first. I don't know if this is working. Can, is this working? Yeah. Is this working? Is that working? Can you hear him? <coughs> yeah, no, yeah. Okay, could you just stand up and, and speak loudly? That would be great. Yeah, okay. Um, how about if uh, it is about creating a new ontology? So it doesn't fit into any of these and, or the next 24 hours, but it's about shaping ontology itself. Give me some more. Well, oh, later. <laughs> it's about shaping. Yeah, okay, okay. It's like uh, you're getting a material which is actually immateriality itself. So uh, you're being shown that all the strictures, all the shapes, everything that we've been using uh, until now <coughs> are just, uh, just something in the flow that we thought we could catch. But actually, these are just illusions. Every time you look at something, it shifts into something else. So that's what it's showing us to go, 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 whoosh! And... Flashing at the right time there. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. How we, as a scientist, I'm not sure how we're going to test that. Uh, but uh, as a scientist also I realise we get to the kind of the fence at the edge of our field of expertise and there our kind of understanding ends and we have to kind of leave over the fence into unknown territory so I'm kind of open to all interpretations and speculations and I, I quite like that poetically if nothing else. Mike. Um, there's, there's a, a category I think you're, you're missing unless I misunderstand it. Several problems. And uh, that is... <laughs> If you read the Bard of Turdor, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, uh, it says, always remember that these entities that you, that you see are projections of your own mind, and that, uh, that, that they are nothing but your, your, yourself. Um, so, um, I think that might be interpreted also in a psychological way, that say that, you know, unless you... Uh, integrate these things into yourself, you know, you're, you'll be, uh, you know, uh, doomed to samsara, you know, doomed to, to uh, uh, the, a life of, of uh, cyclic existence, as it's put. So, I also um, think that that's, that they, when they talk about these entities, and even dwarf entities in the Book of the Dead, it probably means that they were doing something with tryptamines. Undoubtedly. Uh, and that moves into your talk. <laughs> yeah. Can I jump in there and suggest, okay, because we're running out of time, but yeah. I, I think I like that. I mean, the whole <laughs> psychological position, but if these are kind of aspects of ourselves which have to be integrated, I mean, that's the title of my talk. How do we prove one's elf, you know, as well? Uh, so if they, maybe they're reflecting back at as well, how do we understand ourselves to be real if we can think, understand those to be real. Well, well, in Buddhism you don't. It's like, no, you're not real either. Oh, there you go. On to some yeah. <laughs> Terence McKenna actually said as well, that, you know, the reason these things seem so alien is they're a part, he said many things about the MTLs, one of them was, is that they seem so alien because we have alienated a part of ourselves. So, that's something. Question here in the middle. And then Kerry. Well, actually I was going to uh, speak about something that you just brought up, but I'd like to have a little uh, part to it because you speak about entities may or may not be real but belong to a higher realm. And entities encountered exist as a real discarnate being. And I think that ultimately the whole thing is illusion. So maybe I'm dreaming all of this. You are the elf I'm dreaming. I mean, I'm dreaming all of this. And like in the vegetables of the dead, when we see these monsters, it's really just for us to say, 
oh my God, this is all me. I have only fear to fear, if there's going to be fear. And I think that it's a definite mix of just the same way I can dream you guys, I can also dream things on a higher level. Like in my own strata of consciousness, as I move up the ladder, I'm being exposed to different entities, which are actually reflections of myself. So it's kind of a mix of the last two. Thank you for that. I won't answer that one, but I'll move on to a question there. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if we could have a quick vote. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, okay, so hands up for the constructivist position. Not a few, not sure, was yeah, Okay, not so many. Okay, contextualist, slightly more popular. Essentialist, perennialist, I've kind of got a bit of a mix of all quite popular. Literalist, go on, who's going to say? Some of us just don't want to vote. <laughs> David, David, can I just say something? We should have a vote for somebody who thinks it's all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's an appeal for you all to stay till my paper, because I'll explain why it's all of that. <laughs> that's a tease, I like that. <laughs> Possibly, but why does everyone get elves? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what's the spirit of DMT? Well, quite. Uh, this is an interesting question. Like, is it a praying mantis? Is it an elf? I don't know. It's a joker. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd find it interesting, though. Go on. And, and his book, The Vision of the Voice, where he maps all kinds of altered states. And one of his entries, he actually describes self transforming machine elves. Crowley does. Yeah. Oh, that's where he nicked it from. <laughs> Luke. Tell us about the prime numbers thing, asking for information. The what, sorry? Asking the elves for information. The oh, yeah, so there was a Rodriguez. So in, I'm interested in the ontology. So, how do we, okay, how do we establish what the real nature of these things are? Okay, so there's a guy called Rodriguez. Rodrigo. He put forward this idea. It's like, well, we can test the elves, okay? We can set up a, a, a task for them to do. Uh, whereby if they can give you an answer to a math puzzle, uh, say, uh, that you couldn't possibly know, you can then prove that they exist. Which is a kind of interesting idea. It's got a few holes in it though, which I point out. Uh, not least, like, they have to be willing to cooperate, and uh, they have to be like, really good at maths, yeah. Which they probably are. And people say they're pretty omniscient in their experience of them. But also, it's, it falls down on a massive floor. If you're a parapsychologist like me, uh, all the research we've been doing for years and years and years, over 130 years, trying to establish the nature of communication with discarnate entities, i.e. Like spirits of the dead, through mediums, it falls down on the fact that, well, it could just be telepathy or clairvoyance. Just, okay. Uh, so it falls apart on a few uh, levels. But scientifically, it's a pretty tricky thing to get at. And I'm actually going to call it to a close there.